Good evening, evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to our fifth webinar on cultural heritage and sustainable development. We gathered in Zoom today on this beautiful day of March to discuss the policy and partnerships coming together to mobilize heritage for sustainable development. The month of March is full of important days, which aim at highlighting the value of our health and well being, as well as our natural environment celebrating wildlife, water, and forests. The month starts with Zero Discrimination Day, celebrated annually on the 1st of March, and the awareness on mental and physical well-being is promoted throughout the month with several dedicated days. Uh, we are getting closer to the equinox, marking the beginning of spring for the Northern Hemisphere and autumn for the Southern. The same day, 20 March, we will also celebrate the International Day of happiness, among others. As mentioned earlier, today our focus is policy and partnerships coming together to mobilize heritage for sustainable development. We will talk about the influence of policy documents in harnessing the potential of heritage to support a sustainable development. We will share with you the efforts of ICOMOS and Sustainable Development Working Group in guiding the policymaking processes to achieve this goal. We will also speak about the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships to share knowledge, technologies, expertise, and um, resources to protect, conserve, and manage heritage while promoting a sustainable development. We are happy that you could join us today. My name is Mirai hasaltun Woshinski, and I am a heritage consultant and the communications officer of Sustainable Development Goals Working Group. Together with Laura Marik, the ICOMOS Emerging Professionals Working Group Multilingual Communications Officer, we will be moderating the questions and answers session in English, French, and Spanish. The presentations will be in English. However, the key points will be shared in the chat box in French and Spanish. Ona Vileikis, Research Fellow at the University College London and representative of the International Scientific Committee on CHIPA, Heritage documentation to the ICOMOS SDGVG will be supporting us with Spanish translations. We will have three presentations, which will be followed by a questions and answers session. Afterwards, Gabriel Caballero, the focal point, ICOMOS focal point on the sustainable development goals, will wrap up the discussions of the day. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers. The first topic of the day will be presented by five speakers. Sophia Labadi, Professor in Heritage at University of Kent, Ege Yildirim, Heritage Planner, Ilaria Rosetti, PhD candidate at University of Antwerp and Arches Research Group, Francesca Giliberto, Postdoctoral post Research Fellow at Praxis, University of Leeds and University of Kent, and Linda Shetabi, Heritage Consultant and PhD candidate in Urban Studies, University of Glasgow, will be our first presenters. Our presenters will speak about the policy guidance document, which was produced as a part of the priority action plan of Sustainable Development Goals Working Group. We will hear about the document's aims, key messages, case studies implemented uh, by ICOMOS members integrating multiple sustainable development goals. We will also hear about how the document can be used by various actors in and outside of the heritage field in the future. Our second presentation will be by Roy Kitty. Roy is the coordinator of the Andean, Cultural, uh, Andean Countries Hub under United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat. His presentation will focus on the role of partnerships to achieve a sustainable urban development at the times of fast-paced urban trans transformation, poor economic resources, conflict, and several other challenges. Our last speaker today will be Tim Badman. Tim is the director of the World Heritage Program at International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Tim will speak about Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community, which hosts a repository of case studies of solutions collects information on management practices, and provides a platform to share experience and build a network. We will hear from Tim how Panorama can contribute to nature, culture, conservation, and sustainable development. Our expert reactor on Facebook today is Olympia Nilio. 
Olympia is the representative of the International Scientific Committee on the analysis and restoration of the structures of architectural heritage to the ICOMOS SDGVG, and professor in comparative history of architecture at Hokkaido University, Japan. Olympia will also support us with tra Spanish translations. Before we start, just a few housekeeping tips. Please meet you on, meet you on uh, your microphones and turn off your videos. For security reasons, please provide your full name and affiliation so we know who you are. We will have a questions and answers session at the end of the presentations. So please send your questions and comments in the chat box. You can ask your questions in English, Spanish, and French. If you would like to address your question to a particular speaker, please do not forget to indicate it in your message. I would like to remind you that we are live on Facebook at the ICOMOS International Facebook page, where our expert reactor, Olympia, is ready to address your questions as well. Last but not least, I would like to thank our webinar coordinating team members, Gabriel, Linda, Ona, Lor, Nader, as well as Angelique and Celia from ICOMOS Secretariat, Laura and Princess from UN Habitat, Eugene, Nicole, and Maya from Panorama Solutions for all their hard work and support in organizing this webinar. This is our fifth webinar. Throughout the, this, uh, this webinar series, we brought together 22 speakers representing various key partners and tackled cultural heritage and sustainable development in relation to each of the 17 sustainable development goals. This is a good opportunity to remind you that our webinars are recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel. You can find the link in the chat box. Without further ado, I invite our speakers for the first presentation of the day, Heritage and the Sustainable Development Goals, a policy guidance for heritage and development actors. You have the floor. Hello, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for um, having joined us for um, this uh, final uh, webinar. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, 2030 agenda and the um, sustainable development goals represent some progress in acknowledging the role of culture and sustainable development processes. In particular, target 11.4, as we all know, explicitly aims to, and I quote, protect the world's cultural and natural heritage under goal 11 on sustainable cities and communities. And there are several other direct and indirect references to um, culture and heritage throughout this document. However, it is the firm belief of the team who uh, wrote um, the policy guidance that we're going to present to you today, um, that the sustainable development goals fail to acknowledge fully and affirm the importance of heritage as a driver and as enabler of sustainable development. At ECOMOS, we strongly believe that heritage understood in its broader sense as including cultural and natural heritage, as well as intangible and tangible manifestation, can play a key role in addressing the sustainable development goals, not only sustainable development goals 11, but each and every SDG. So while ECOMOS has various documents on heritage for the sustainable development, we thought that the more comprehensive texts explaining how heritage contributing to each and every sustainable development goal was still needed. And this is the reason why we've written um, policy guidance that we're going to present to you today, and which I believe is being also released today, which is the reason why we're having this webinar today. Another wonderful uh, reason for being in March to continue what Mireille was saying earlier on. Next slide, please. So the policy guidance, and you have the, um, the front page on the screen, uh, is an important step 
and provided such a comprehensive approach in, target, in, in tackling all of the SDG. It illustrates where heritage can make a positive contribution and be leveraged by all actors in the heritage and development fields to improve policy and practice. However, this document also addresses the challenging points where heritage practices might be at odds with sustainable development objectives, with the awareness that more in-depth studies and debates are called for in the future um, and in the work of the SDG Working Group. We were indeed guided in our work to draft this policy guidance by the do no harm principle. And we are all well aware that in some cases, heritage practices do harm and they are not aligned with some principle from the sustainable development goals. But as I said, more work is needed on this topic. So let's precisely look at uh, this policy guidance. The aim of this text is twofold. It seeks to address development actors and raise awareness of the potential contribution of heritage to sustainable development pr processes. On the other hand, it provides guidance, as the name indicates, to e-commerce members and other professionals at large in adopting a sustainable development perspective in their heritage practices and aligning them to the sustainable development goals. Therefore, we, the team, believes that this guidance represents a first attempt to provide a policy framework for all actors, including international organization, national and local governments, businesses, civil society, and expert organization, which is potentially suitable for both high level policy and grassroots implementation. The policy guidance aspires to help build synergies and strengthen advocacy. And I would like to finish with this idea of advocacy. I think this is a fundamental aspect of this policy guidance because so much of what heritage professionals still do focus on a narrow understanding of heritage preservation, conservation and management only. So the role of this policy guidance, which we are going to release today, is to highlight that heritage is more than just being about conservation and preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so I'm taking over um, the, um, uh, this part of the presentation. Uh, we are presenting as a team, um, as um, was all our drafting effort for the last uh, two, more than two years, um, our policy guidance team. Um, so this is um, uh, the section on how um, the policy guidance was drafted. Um, so this process uh, began um, at the end of 2018 um, upon the request of e-commerce leadership to have a tangible output, as Sophia was saying, a comprehensive um, uh, guidance document uh, to uh, steer our work in heritage and sustainable development. Um, so this uh, took place during the Buenos Aires um, Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, in, tw in 2018 December, um, soon after which um, we started uh, work by uh, coming together as um, myself um, when I was um, the SDG's focal point at that time uh, with Sophia, um, who was uh, invited to be the task team um, coordinator for the policy guidance. Um, and soon after, Francesco Giliberto, Ilaria Rosetti, and Linda Shetabi joined us um, as colleagues who were working intensely on, on the topic of heritage and sustainability as well. Um, so uh, a concept note uh, began to be developed. Um, and um, after that, we started to collect inputs from e-commerce membership through various platforms. Um, back in the days before COVID, when we could meet face to face in person, um, we took the opportunity of the Marrakesh Advisory Committee meeting and symposium um, in October 2019 to hold two events. One was a knowledge cafe organized by Patricia O'Donnell, Ilaria Rosetti and myself. And the other one was an experts meeting meeting, um, which was focused on the SDGs working group, plus um, other um, participants of the symposium based on an open call. 
After these in-person meetings, we also launched an online survey for gathering inputs from the SDGs working group members, uh, both on potential case studies to illustrate each SDGs relationship and on key points that they would like to make. I will go to the next slide. And um, so the work continued after these um, uh, input gathering sessions um, when we sat down to actually write the uh, first drafts of the document. The interim drafts um, were prepared um, first um, as a zero draft, which was launched in July 2020 um, and um, circulated for online review by the SDGs working group members. Um, this um, continued until September, um, after which we um, incorporated the comments received and uh, circulated an, uh, for another round um, around um, December 2020, which we called um, Christmas draft um, at that time um, to mark the date. Um, and this was also for SDG working group members, um, but it was also um, to make sure that the, all ISCs, our international scientific committees, our national committees and our working groups were um, fully included in the process. Uh, we, all, we launched um, a call um, as a targeted invitation to each um, committee representative, president and secretary general, um, as our working group is still in the process of um, completing its full, full representation by all committees. After gathering um, these inputs, uh, we have uh, finalized uh, the draft um, in early 2021. Um, and after the copy editing and graphic layout uh, sessions that have been intensively continuing in, in the past weeks and even days, uh, we finally have our document uploaded today for you. Um, thanks to the many contributions we received from uh, 56 individual experts, 13 ISC uh, institutional representations, 20 national committee representations, and a total of 66 ECOMOS members, plus uh, case study contributors who included ECOMOS members and other um, colleagues in the, in the heritage um, sector. Um, and here we are with our first edition, we, we, which we call um, as a first edition only be, because we see this as a living document which may have future iterations um, as discussions continue um, on the topic. Um, we've, we're launching it in English today um, as an online document, um, but soon um, I'm sure our French and Spanish and other language translations uh, will be coming out. Um, they are already being requested and um, of course they're under consideration um, for us by us to, to start as well. Uh, but we have actually now um, ended an era and we're very happy to have this baby born as we say um, and in the phase two um, all of these um, further considerations uh, will take place. Um, we are uh, we try to do this as um, an inclusive and collective effort as much as possible within the time resources that we had. Um, it must be noted though that this policy guidance is more streamlined than the standard ECOMOS doctrinal process, which, which takes um, significantly longer, um, several years. Um, in Again, in the future iterations, we may um, also consider to um, un undergo a, a standard ECOMOS doctrinal process, and these are all to be seen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm handing over the word, um, to my colleague, Ilaria Rosetti, at this point. Thank you, Ege. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, today I'm uh, responsible to introduce the structure of the document to you. So the document starts with an executive summary, a foreword, and an introduction. It continues with 17 sections, one for each SDG, and includes a baseline, a policy statement, and a case study. While some SDGs might seem more relevant to heritage than others, the approach has been to treat them all consistently, as Sofia and Ege have already uh, explained before, in order to explain all possible linkages between heritage practices and sustainable development. The document concludes with some recommendations for the way forward, a glossary, and a list of references from ICOMOS and other sources. All policy statements that are presented in these documents converge under the main policy directive to harness the power of heritage to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. And they are all grounded in the five Ps underlying the 2030 Agenda. People, planet, pros prosperity, peace, and partnership. Next slide, please.
Okay, so this is an example of how a specific SDG section looks like. On the left, you can find the baseline, which is composed of two parts. The first one con contextualizes uh, the progresses and challenges currently faced in achieving the SDGs. In this case, SDG 16. Next slide, please. The main references used for this section are the United Nations 2019 Sustainable Development Goals Report and the UN Knowledge Platform with its tools. Next slide, please. So the, the second part of the baseline introduces the threats, potentials, and critical aspects of heritage practices in that wider context. Next slide, please. Uh, we built that second part of the baseline, uh, starting from the analysis of previously issued ICOMOS doctrinal documents, the exploration of linkages with the SDGs targets and indicators, and eventually we drew from the task team one academic and professional knowledge, as well as from the knowledge of the SDGs working group at large through multiple meetings and rounds of reviews, as previously mentioned by Ege. Here I would like to thank one more, once more all the fantastic people who worked with us uh, throughout this uh, long journey. Next slide, please. Moving forward, on the right you can find the policy statement, which is directly inspired by the text of the SDGs and supports the harnessing of heritage for sustainable development. It follows a set of specific recommendations for heritage and development actors to integrate and implement the policy statements in their policies and practices. Next slide, please. In developing these recommended actions, we adopted a threefold approach. We looked at the integration of heritage as a positive contributor to sustainable development, at the protection of heritage from harm during development processes, and eventually, but not less importantly, at the uh, imp improvement of heritage practices for their better alignment with sustainable development objectives. And now I leave the word to my colleague, Francesca Gilibert, to say something more about case studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilaria, and hello, everybody. So in addition to what has been said by Ilaria about the structure of the policy guidance, each SDG section includes also a case study that illustrates the interplay of heritage practices with a specific goal, for example, SDG 1, but also with other supporting goals, and in some cases, also with more detailed SDGs targets. You can see, for example, in the slide, at the bottom of this slide, how uh, each case studies can address several SDGs and SDGs targets. Showing the capacity of heritage to support the achievement of each SDGs, um, but also uh, the case studies showing, show the capacity of heritage to support the achievement of each SDGs, but also to cross cut across several SDGs, which was one of the key objective of this policy guidance document. Next slide, please. Okay, so case studies were, selecting, uh, were selected looking at uh, the institutional projects implemented by ECOMOS according to the ECOMOS annual reports and to the, to the large consultation process with the broader ECOMOS membership previously described by um, Ege and Ilaria. As a result, the policy guidance document presents one case studies for each SDGs, which is considered to be the main SDGs addressed, even if the case studies tackle, tackles multiple SDGs at the same time. Um, Okay, <laughs> so we are already in the next slide. So case studies were implemented by ECOMOS as an institution or by individual ECOMOS members or national and or international scientific committees working in collaboration with other international organizations such as for example, uh, UNESCO, FAO, the World Earth Organization, the World Bank and many others, but also with um, NGOs, uh, universities, local authorities, civil society and private actors with an interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral approach. To give you an idea about the, the kind of uh, case studies included in the policy guidance document, 
we can find on the one end among the institutional projects, for example, uh, the case studies of connecting practice for SDG2 or the US e-commerce international exchange program for SDG4, our common dignity initiative, right-based approaches to heritage for SDG10, um, the culture natural journey for SDG 15, and the heritage on, on the edge, communicating climate urgency through cultural heritage for SDG 13, and the climate heritage network for SDG 17. Other example of uh, project in, implemented by, of case studies implemented by uh, individual e-commerce members, but of course in partnership with other organizations and um, institutions and uh, partners. Uh, we can find, for example, um, the, in the case of the rehabilitation of the median of fats for SDG 1, AUG travel, use of interpretation technology to build a sustainable tourism model for SDG 8, or for example, the Global Sustainable Tourist Council criteria for SDG 12. Uh, our work uh, purposely decided not to focus only on World Heritage properties, but to showcase example of how heritage in general can be addressed, uh, can be harnessed, sorry, to achieve the, the SDGs. Next slide, please. Okay, as you can see in this example, maybe not very well, but each case studies is divided into different um, uh, parts. So uh, the policy guidance provide for each case studies information about their location, of course, all around the world, uh, the time frame uh, where these case studies, when these case studies were implemented, the people institution involved, a short project descriptions, and uh, their contribution to multiple uh, SDGs. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, a few pictures to give you a visual idea about how the, the case studies will, will look like. Uh, uh, each case study was drafted by e-commerce members who have actually contributed to, to their implementation following our overall guidance. I would like to take this occasion to thank all the 28 e-commerce members who have collaborated with us in the realization of this part of the, of the policy guidance document. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, when selecting the case studies, we paid particular attention to uh, ensure a balanced worldwide geographical representation. Uh, 11 projects were implemented in specific locations all around the world, while other six projects were implemented on a worldwide level, like for example, the Culture and Nature Journey or the Climate Heritage Network. However, uh, our team uh, is well aware that we could not cover the global geographical and cultural complexity only in uh, the 17, 17 case studies presented in the policy guidance document, which constitutes, uh, as previously mentioned, only the first phase of this work and should be followed by a concrete implementation on the ground and the collection and dissemination of a greater number of case studies. But for this, uh, I will give the floor to Linda, our future Task Team 1 coordinator. Thank you, Francesca. It's my privilege to be here today, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and to all my friends and colleagues who celebrate Noruz this weekend, Noruz Eton Pius. The second phase of our work will focus on implementation strategies for the policy guidance, putting the policy guidance document into practice. Looking at intersectoral and integrated approaches, we hope to transform the policy recommendations into effective, measurable action. Part of that would be to work with academia, practitioners, ECOMOS, national committees, international scientific committees, and working groups to develop indicators that can help us measure the impact of heritage practices as drivers of sustainable development. As Sophia mentioned, throughout the process of developing the policy guidance document and through all the excellent comments we received, we were acutely aware that heritage in all its forms is not always aligned with sustainable development goals. Addressing this will require, at a first instance, regional and local discussions, and then larger international dialogues. Some contradictions just can't be resolved this generation. After all, we need to leave some difficult tasks for our next generations. But we can start making these discussions and making these discussions more mainstream 
and remove some of the taboos associated with the inconsistencies and contradictions that we faced. We are also acutely aware that the SDGs themselves are not perfect. So these discussions will have to be flexible and open. Flexibility is one of those tricky words, but we need it to be able to integrate evolving perspectives on sustainable development and heritage to produce policy that's relevant and practical in future iterations of our policy documents. ECOMOS 2017 Action Plan called for concrete actions and local diversity, adapting the goals to the regional and local context interaction with localities at the level of the citizen and local decision making. This is fundamental and through our ECOMOS committees across the world, we're hoping to be able to address the nuances that just could not be reflected in this first policy guidance document. We're keen to have practitioners develop their own responses and in working with national committees, international scientific committees and working groups shape regional policy in a way that's more relevant and grounded in local context. Through the process, we also learned of some of the excellent work that our members are already doing across the world that address the SDGs and we're keen to work on developing a better strategy to disseminate these case studies and use them as leverage for more productive strategic partnerships in delivering the SDGs through an heritage. By strengthening these partnerships, we're hoping to shore up support for various partners from within and outside the heritage sector and encourage further useful research and studies on heritage and the SDGs. We are currently in discussions with groups and external partners on possible collaborative work. So if you have an idea or a proposal, please do get in touch with myself or Gabriel and let's just push heritage in front of the SDG train. Thank you very much for joining us and I pass the stage back on to you, Murray. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sofia, Linda, Ilaria, Francesca, and Linda for presenting the outcomes of your efforts. Um, it's very important to underline once more, even though Ege already mentioned, uh, the policy guidance document is the fruit of more than two years of interviews, research, and consultation process. Sincere congratulations to our task team on this outstanding document. And good news is that you can now download the document from the ICOMOS website, and the link will be posted in the chat box. Now we continue with our next presentation. Um, I pass the floor to you, Roy. Thank you so much. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Roy Kitty. I'm the coordinator for the Andean countries uh, at UN Habitat and also responsible for uh, regional alliances here in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. So first of all, thank you so much for the, for the invitation, for, uh, for inviting UN Habitat, and uh, also congratulations for the policy guidance uh, document uh, that uh, I just learned that is, uh, is going to be a great contribution to the, to the debate. Uh, today, I would like to, to highlight a few elements of the uh, partnerships, uh, uh, platforms, and initiatives that, uh, and approaches that the UN Habitat uh, is uh, having vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the issue of uh, urban heritage. So I will start uh, right away. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I will start by, um, by uh, presenting UN Habitat, as you know, is the United Nations Human Settlements Program, and it was uh, established in 2001 um, after the Habitat II conference uh, when, when the member states uh, took uh, the decision and adopted uh, this uh, transformation to a fully-fledged uh, program. 
um, it's the, uh, the agency with the mandate on uh, housing and human settlements uh, activities. And uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, uh, the mandate itself has been, uh, has been, uh, um, has been acquiring more importance in the light of the, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goal 11, that is about sustainable cities and communities. And the year after that, uh, in 2016, with the adoption of the new urban agenda, that is a, a, a commitment of member states on uh, key principles and uh, standard of achievements for uh, uh, um, actually realizing the, uh, the objective uh, of the goal 11, making cities and human settlements uh, inclusive, safe, resilient, and uh, sustainable. The next slide, please. <clears throat> well, uh, as, you, as you certainly know, uh, it was uh, a great opportunity to have uh, this, uh, the incorporation of the goal 11 among the 17 goals, uh, uh, for sustainable development, uh, also because uh, uh, it was found that uh, uh, could be a good, uh, a good, uh, an ideal platform uh, for uh, for uh, uh, articulating uh, um, articulating actions that can uh, not only contribute to the goal itself, but also to a large variety of uh, of targets and goals. Uh, uh, across the 17 uh, SDGs, and uh, uh, also an ideal platform for uh, joint actions and partnerships. So in the space of, uh, uh, in the urban space, in the urban and territorial space, uh, it, is, uh, it is thought that, uh, that uh, um, different partners can work together and uh, um, contributing uh, uh, to different uh, different uh, goals and uh, I, I think that the urban heritage is also a, a, simi a similar ground you know can be used as a similar ground in fact uh, can be uh, thought as a qualitative element uh, that uh, can articulate uh, can articulate uh, the social the economic and the environmental uh, dimensions and uh, and therefore impacting on uh, the key the key aspects, uh, the key, see, yes, the, the key aspects of the SDG 11. So the, the element of inclusivity, so uh, making uh, possible, uh, making possible this uh, this dimension of the, of inclusion, uh, safety, resilience, and learning from from uh, the, the from different culture, and especially um, when we talk about uh, heritage, uh, we talk about culture that probably were much more uh, much more conversant uh, to to the to to re to be resilient uh, uh, with their own uh, territory and uh, uh, exert, exert uh, activities that were more sustainable no um, the next one so basically the um, the, the goal 11 includes uh, uh, the target 11.4 that is about strengthening the efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. So the indicator, uh, the indicator that was, uh, was identified for this goal uh, was uh, actually very quantitative and uh, uh, will be measuring the total per capita expenditure on uh, the preservation, protection and conservation, which of course, as uh, its uh, pros and cons, in the sense that is uh, is probably something that we can measure uh, quite well. Uh, we have the tools to measure it, but certainly uh, is not covering all the impacts that uh, working properly with urban heritage uh, can have uh, on different uh, other aspects. The next uh, slide, please. Yeah, basically, this just uh, before introducing the, 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 the elements of the new urban agenda that uh, incorporate uh, urban heritage, I would like to uh, recall uh, the, the preparatory process for, uh, for uh, Habitat 3, the conference that uh, in 2016 saw the adoption of the new urban agenda. 
And uh, this was a very inclusive preparatory process that allowed uh, partnerships, uh, alliances uh, to be formed around uh, key thematic issues. And of course, uh, urban heritage was not, uh, was not the exception. And uh, uh, there was uh, a policy paper on sociocultural uh, uh, urban frameworks. There was an issue paper prepared by uh, different uh, UN agencies uh, with UN Habitat, UNESCO and others uh, on urban culture and heritage. And also uh, among the various meetings uh, that were organized to, to gather inputs for the, the new urban agenda, there were uh, regional and thematic meetings that of course incorporated the heritage and culture as uh, uh, especially as a local development asset for cities. And, uh, uh, for this uh, theme, uh, I think the, the, the conference uh, on intermediate cities that took place in uh, Cuenca, Ecuador, was uh, uh, very, very critical for that. The next one. So as a result of this preparatory process, uh, uh, the member states, uh, in fact, incorporated, uh, uh, among other, uh, all the other issues, in, incorporated the heritage and culture in the new urban agenda. And particularly in the first section of the, of the new urban agenda that talks about uh, the transformative commitments, uh, and uh, they are divided in the, in the three dimensions. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, the, the mention on uh, on the importance of uh, urban and cultural, uh, natural and cultural heritage was uh, incorporated in the social dimension, no? as far as the sustainable urban development for social inclusion and then the poverty is concerned. The Article 38, uh, in the Article 38, the, the member states commit to leveraging uh, uh, natural and uh, cultural heritage, uh, both uh, tangible and intangible in cities and human settlement, settlements, committing to safeguard and promote uh, uh, cultural sites and infrastructures, and also uh, in strengthening uh, the social participation uh, and exercise of, of citizens, citizenship through the use of uh, uh, urban uh, heritage. No? Um, and uh, they uh, they also um, introduced, uh, uh, adopted the, the introduction of the urban heritage in the, in the more action-oriented part of the new urban agenda, which is about the effective implementation. And uh, they committed to include culture as a priority component in urban plans and strategies, and also highlighting uh, the need uh, to protect uh, the heritage uh, from, uh, from uh, disruptive impacts uh, of uh, urban development. And here uh, they, they, also, they also highlighted the, the, the need to balance uh, these two elements, no? the protection and the uh, future uh, necessary developments. The next one, I will try to accelerate because I, I think... Uh, I don't have much time. So um, UN Habitat, uh, after the, the, the adoption of the new urban agenda, of course, incorporated all these, uh, all these aspects. Uh, in, and uh, in, the, in our strategic plan for 2020, 2023, for these four years, um, urban heritage is uh, streamlined across uh, the four, the four uh, domains of change. Uh, that we identified for uh, our actions. And uh, especially uh, the domain of change one uh, on reduced spatial inequality and poverty in communities across uh, the urban rural continuum, strengthened climate action and improved the urban environment. So all the element of uh, resilience and climate change. And uh, also in, uh, in a new uh, strengthened uh, domain of change, uh, at the UN Habitat uh, that is, is currently being, uh, being uh, strengthened is uh, the effective urban crisis prevention and response. So how urban heritage can help in, uh, in uh, situation of conflicts uh, and, uh, and the displacements. And uh, uh, partnerships, uh, in fact, is uh, a, a key performance uh, enablers. So we are uh, actually uh, using partnerships uh, also to, to, to ensure that uh, 
that uh, uh, urban heritage is incorporated in our actions in all the four domains. The next one. Yeah, as I said, uh, as I said, is a, is a cross-cutting team uh, and uh, and uh, actually, especially in domain of change one, three, and four, uh, is where where we are uh, working a lot with uh, urban heritage. And uh, um, after and after these few slides, I will uh, I will uh, uh, I will show you uh, three examples for that. The next one, please. Here, here I wanted to mention the two key platforms that we have for partnerships. Uh, is the are the World Urban Campaign that is uh, a coalition of partners uh, of different partners and in particular I would like to mention uh, the the HPF the Habitat Professional Forum and I'm sure that uh, many many uh, professionals that are part of the ECOMOS uh, group uh, are also part of the Habitat Professional Forum and we have been collaborating in that and then the World Urban Forum as the as the as the the big uh, be, um, the big conference uh, on uh, housing and urban and sustainable urban development and cities uh, uh, that takes place every two years and where uh, a wide range of partners uh, they they uh, they gather to to review uh, their to review their achievements uh, to identify challenges uh, and also to to um, to organize uh, new init initiatives and new partnerships and in particular I would like to highlight the last session that uh, took place in Abu Dhabi just before uh, the, the the beginning of the pandemic and uh, and um, that was was having a, a strong focus on uh, culture and innovation and by extent of, of course on urban heritage the next one uh, within the World Urban Campaign, there are uh, there are initiatives like the Urban Thinkers Campuses uh, that are uh, thematic uh, meetings uh, that uh, take place uh, um, among uh, among groups, uh, different groups of partners. Uh, and uh, I, I, here I just mentioned one that has been uh, has been organized on the case of uh, for the Beirut uh, reconstruction. The next one. Another uh, initiative, interesting initiative, is the one that UN Habitat is implementing with uh, UCLG and Metropolis. Uh, there was a, a series of thematic session on culture and the cultural mobilization in the time of COVID, which, uh, which uh, provided uh, the preparation of, uh, of several uh, interesting papers. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I I want to mention the the recent uh, uh, renewed partnerships uh, between uh, ONU Habitat, UN Habitat, and uh, ICOMOS. So during the, the the last session of the World Urban Forum, a, a memorandum of understanding was was signed among the the two entities, and uh, the the. The primary objective is to consolidate the partnership, ensuring that uh, the world's cultural heritage is protected, managed, and, and harnessed for sustainable urban development. Next one, please. Well, here uh, a bit uh, the, the, the a bit uh, more in details uh, what uh, what the two organizations uh, are going to work. Uh, on uh, and uh, I'm talking about uh, policy inputs on urban heritage uh, uh, guidelines, uh, legislations, plans, and projects, uh, and knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge products, uh, uh, partnerships, uh, initiatives, uh, and then of course uh, working on uh, monitoring and data uh, on the uh, on uh, heritage management. I would like to conclude with uh, three examples of. Uh, of uh, projects uh, that uh, UN Habitat uh, is uh, is implementing with different uh, partners, uh, especially local authorities, uh, but also with uh, with uh, the partnerships of uh, communities, uh, academias, uh, and uh, professionals and other actors. Uh, the first one is uh, the Kisumu Lakefront uh, in Kenya. So we are working on preserving and putting into value the the great historical and environmental uh, heritage uh, of this uh, of this city is the next uh, slide please 
and uh, yes, in this project we work on uh, with through our three pronged approach uh, on rules and regulations, uh, financial uh, plans, uh, and planning and design. And uh, basically, we are we are uh, actually the the, the project uh, is uh, is providing uh, good solutions on these three uh, three uh, key key elements uh, and uh, especially to preserve the Kisumu colonial and natural heritage through the technical advisory to the county government and in particular to trying to connect the city center to the waterfront reactivating the, the area and uh, encouraging uh, uh, the, the creation of uh, and strengthening of local economies and uh, while preserving the natural heritage. A second um, example the next one please is on uh, um is on uh, it's more about resilience uh, and is on uh, is an intervention uh, in Wuchan district in china and uh, is basically an intervention oriented to strengthen climate action and improve the uh, urban environments and particularly in an area uh, with uh, with a very a very um, delicate ec ecosystem uh, that has been affected by uh, rapid uh, urbanization, as you can see in these maps. Uh, in in uh, 30 years, uh, uh, the area uh, was completely urbanized. So the project aims to recover the resilient uh, equilibrium or balance uh, uh, with nature, creating a network of walk walkable streets and public spaces leveraging heritage and uh, and um, and culture and nature uh, the the last one is uh, another um, another project in africa uh, the Kalo Bay refugee settlements in turkana kenya this is a very much uh, people centered uh, heritage conservation approach uh, and uh, and um, where uh, in the development of the of the settlement for both uh, refugees and host, and host communities we considered uh, preserving and integrating uh, the turkana heritage uh, throughout uh, the project here you can see uh, experts uh, that engage with uh, with the local community and and, uh, and with the, the the refugees uh, to use uh, um, technology technology that are part of the of the cultural heritage of these uh, communities uh, for the construction of uh, of shelters so i would like to conclude uh, of course uh, thanking uh, uh, icomos and uh, and all the organizers uh, i would like to leave uh, just these uh, three three messages so one on the reconciliation of heritage heritage conservation on the need to reconcile heritage conservation and urban development so uh, strengthen the positive relation between conservation and uh, the needs of development then uh, the, the, the aspect of uh, um, and the importance of heritage to ensure that no one is left, uh, is left behind. As you know, in many cities, urban regeneration in the past and probably in the present, uh, together with heritage uh, conservation, uh, have, not, uh, uh, have not had uh, uh, major impacts on poverty reduction and on the contrary, in some cases, uh, uh, provoked uh, um, provoked uh, uh, um, situation of uh, expulsion of poor of the poor in the in the regenerated area. And uh, the last message uh, is uh, is about learning. No, as we we see in uh, we saw in the, these three uh, pro sample of projects, uh, how to to use. Uh, uh, heritage through the buildings and urban partners for uh, for the development of cities and using uh, that knowledge uh, to shape uh, uh, new expansions uh, also taking advantage of the the opportunities that this opens for the economy for the social inclusion and for resilience and climate change so thank you so much uh, and sorry if i took uh, a bit more than uh, the allocated time thanks Thank you, Roy. Um, 
We are almost on time. Um, thank you for sharing the partnership approaches and uh, project examples from you on Habitat, Roy. Um, now, uh, the next presentation is uh, Tim's. I pass the floor to you, Tim. Thanks, Marie. Let me just firstly check. You can see my slides, okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, look, th thanks very much. Thanks so much to Icomos, um, both on behalf of IUCN and on my own behalf for the invitation to join you today. And many congratulations on the policy guidance, which looks brilliant and great to hear about that. Um, it's slightly embarrassing for me to make this presentation as well, because I'm uh, essentially presenting work that some brilliant colleagues have uh, done through the World Heritage Leadership Program, but I think they're all somewhere in the meeting. So let me uh, immediately acknowledge Eugene Joe, uh, Maya Ishizawa, Nicole Franceschini. Um, and I'd also like to add thanks to uh, Marie Fishbourne and her team uh, in Panorama, uh, and also all of the people that are providing solutions that I'll mention briefly in this presentation, as well as Norway, um, that have enabled this work to happen. But with all, uh, with all protocol observed, I will uh, I will say along with, but thanks team, because this is really your brilliant work that I'm, I'm presenting. Um, and if I talk about Panorama, I'm talking about a, a, an initiative that, um, that is hosted by IUCN, ICROM and ICOMOS. And the Panorama Nature Culture thematic community is trying to bring together practitioners from across the heritage sector to share experiences of effective management uh, of inclusive governance, uh, with peers and with the larger community of, of Panorama and with a large audience that are interested in conservation and sustainable development. And the goal uh, that I'll be talking about in this presentation is really to foster a nature culture community of practice uh, that's cross-sectoral, that's multidisciplinary and that works at a global level, um, but also connects locally. Um, I'll, I'll mention World Heritage um, at a, at a number of times in this presentation, but uh, each time I say that, please let me stress um, that we see Panorama being a contribution to heritage practice as a whole um, and not only limited to world heritage. The, the Panorama nature culture community addresses some key issues uh, that are found in policy, uh, in research and in practice, and they're typified by implementation of the World Heritage Convention, but I think are more generally some of the issues that we see um, limiting the effectiveness of the heritage field uh, as a whole. Um, if we focus on the World Heritage uh, Convention, we know this is a unique international legal instrument. It brings together uh, concerns about natural and cultural heritage, but through its 50 year history, it's defined cultural and natural heritage separately in different articles. And in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention, the system itself, uh, the national administrations that relate to it and that, that support heritage more broadly have followed generally a nature culture uh, divide. But we know that this is a divide that does not um, exist at the local level. As um, my dear friend and a colleague of many of us, Nobuko Inaba has said, culture and nature are split from the top, uh, but not to the bottom. And local communities and indigenous peoples hold diversities of worldviews where nature and culture as separate entities is just not the norm. Uh, and so this disconnect has brought misunderstandings and issues in the application of the World Heritage Convention and heritage practice more generally. And we know specifically that it's um, the separation of nature and culture is a way to deny access uh, to um, international conservation policy um, to indigenous peoples and to local communities and conversely bringing nature and culture together creates uh, inclusion and opportunities for local conservation actions to be recognized. And so policy needs to adapt to local realities. It needs to be built um, with collaboration from the ground up. Um, but there's a need to collect evidence and demonstrate that this, uh, uh, this separation and these uh, opportunities of bringing nature and culture together are actually working in practice. Um, so the gathering of evidence is another crucial um, part of what we're doing. Uh, in terms of research and practice, the divide is reflected in the, in the disciplinary and sectoral backgrounds of professionals working in heritage conservation. But in order to understand heritage in a more holistic manner, uh, we need to see interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral exchanges not only necessary, but as a new normal. And so Panorama Nature Culture uh, is, a, is a way to address some of these issues by documenting nature culture practices happening on the ground uh, to provide evidence for policy making um, and to uh, encourage um, approaches that are more holistic, uh, to encourage interdisciplinary research uh, and to encourage um, 
uh, uh, in, encourage uh, and provide the evidence uh, that's needed for um, heritage to be embedded uh, much more effectively in the larger sustainable uh, development framework. So let me tell you a bit more specifically about what Panorama is as a whole. Uh, Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet is a partnership initiative. It was conceived and has been led by IUCN, the International Union of for conservation of nature, uh, the organization I work for, and the German development agency GIZ, but it involves 10 organizations and it tries to connect the fields of conservation, uh, of development and of international cooperation in promoting sustainable development through work and experiences on the ground. Um, it has seven thematic communities, uh, of which we're talking here about the nature culture community, and it's an online platform that documents and promotes examples of inspiring and replicable uh, solutions across a range of conservation and sustainable development topics. And it's, it's a way to enable cross-sectoral learning and, insp and inspiration. It allows practitioners to share and reflect on their experiences, uh, increase recognition for successful work, and to learn from peers about how, how similar challenges have been addressed in other contexts across the globe. And following this uh, panorama solutioning approach, as it's called, case studies are documented and solutions um, are put forward using a standard format that identifies replicable building blocks, which are the key success factors, and the context in which the solutions were implemented. And solutions are shared through the online platform, uh, but also through publications and through events and activities associated um, with Panorama. They're integrated into capacity development activities and workshops, and this methodology for learning and innovation is applicable across topics, uh, across sectors and audiences, supporting the upscaling of successful interventions. And so you can think of it as there being really two main users, the solution providers uh, who are documenting and uploading and sharing their work uh, that is reviewed by uh, experts and peers in, in uh, coming into the portal, but also solution seekers that access um, these uh, examples of what works and then can, a, then can adapt that to their own local context. Um, and the solution seekers can also provide, uh, uh, can also contact solution providers and exchange further information on, on these examples that are being documented in Panorama. And in this way, a network is created that can share knowledge um, and generate new ideas based on, based on peer learning. The Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community was launched uh, in October 2020, and in fact it was launched at the ICOMOS uh, General, Assem General Assembly marker event for the event that uh, unfortunately couldn't take place in Sydney. And it brings together IUCN uh, with ICOMOS and ICROM. We, we're known as the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Convention, but in this context, as in, in the full breadth of our work as, as organizations to collaborate together and curate um, panorama, panorama nature culture. Uh, and so let me at this point thank ICOMOS uh, for the, the collaboration that's enabled uh, Panorama to come into place. And this is one tangible manifestation of the culture nature journey um, that we've been implementing together for, uh, for a long time now, uh, but uh, for the last six or seven years. Um, the um, idea then is that this, uh, this platform, Nature Culture Solutions, showcases examples of heritage places where the interlinkages between natural and cultural heritage are highlighted for um, generating inclusive governance and effective and integrated management on the ground. The portal, the portal is also co-hosting solutions that have come from other thematic communities, such as the ones on protected areas, on marine and coastal conservation, uh, on agriculture, uh, on sustainable urban development, and on resilience amongst others. And at the moment in Panorama as a whole, you'll find or, uh, approaching 300 solutions that can be accessed, but that number um, we're looking to grow um, and you are all part of uh, helping Panorama to grow further. Um, the, uh, the, the platform itself um, has been launched with a new series of 20 uh, curated pilot studies that have been pulled together um, by the team in the World Heritage Leadership uh, Programme, as uh, the people I mentioned at the start of this presentation. Uh, and these 20 have come uh, from sites inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. They showcase examples of processes that involve landscape level um, uh, attention to heritage management and practices that interconnect nature and culture and people, uh, people-centered approaches, um, and that conserve cultural and natural values. 
um, in, in a series of different examples. So we've seen solutions from diverse places such as the rice terraces of the Philippines, the honey terraces in China, which link indigenous and local knowledge to sustainable conservation. Um, we've, we, we have cases such as urban agriculture in the city of Bamberg in Germany, uh, traditional landscape management systems in Bujbim in Australia, and other examples such as the shared governance model used in the Cinque Terre, uh, coastal landscape in Italy, the traditional management of sacred groves in Kenya and in Japan, and many other examples which I don't have the time to uh, explain today, but where um, biocultural heritage is being sustained. Um, let me just emphasize again, though, the portal is not only dedicated to world heritage properties, but it's absolutely there to be populated by examples of nature and culture interactions beyond the World Heritage System and not only in places that have international recognition. If you see nature and culture working on the ground in places that you're working in, those are the places we would like to be represented in Panorama Nature Culture. Um, another development of Panorama uh, through the nature culture community is um, to uh, apply these filters and tags which uh, allow every solution to summarize its content and its connections um, to a series of different ways to think about ecosystems, themes, uh, challenges, um, and the way in which uh, the solution type uh, helps to fulfill uh, different types of international uh, connections, uh, including the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the uh, Aichi uh, targets uh, for biodiversity, uh, shortly to be updated in the new post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and the Sendai Framework. So this manifests the Sustainable Development, development Goals uh, up front. Um, and it's interesting to me that one of the, the outcomes of the nature culture thematic community has been a review of uh, what was missing from the filters and tags in Panorama. So apart from culture being uh, flagged across the whole of Panorama, the importance of local actors um, has now been increasingly uh, recognized with a new tag and the degree to which changes in socio-cultural context um, affect many places uh, has also been added as a new challenge uh, within the Panorama platform. So if I can just summarize some of the things that have come out of um, this work. So in implementing the Panorama nature culture thematic community. Um, we've brought cultural heritage into um, a platform focused at, at, across development and a leading platform for demonstrating and showcasing successful conservation approaches, highlighting the role of culture and heritage in sustainable development and the interlinkages between nature and natural and cultural diversity. A really interesting result is that within the existing um, solutions already on the Panorama platform, we've been able to identify 240 solutions already published that have a cultural component that was not being acknowledged and showing that culture um, and, and heritage does indeed play a role in sustainable development endeavours much more broadly than when you're just talking about culture. And in fact, culture is hidden, in my experience, um, in, in many, many different ways in which conservation is happening. And we need to give it a name um, and, and, and bring it forward. Um, and then, as I've said already, um, you know, by engaging in culture, we can see that the importance of local communities um, really comes to the fore. Um, there are some opportunities um, that I'd like to raise uh, going forward. Um, these include the way that we can really show that um, conservation practice is not just about sort of theory and broad, uh, you know, kind of broad principles, but it works on the ground and we can document experience on the ground and we can document and learn by doing things um, and, 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 and engage with the practitioners who really are at the heart of success uh, for heritage in this world. Um, we can connect practitioners, researchers and decision takers through this platform so we have a constituency to talk to about the connection of culture uh, and nature and, and cultural and natural heritage in a new way. And we can strengthen the exchange between researchers and site managers. And, and one important um, additional benefit, not on this slide, is, is I think Panorama really gives us a, a way to put world heritage in the context which it should be, which is not doing world heritage for its own sake, but seeing world heritage as a, an integral contribution to building better cultural and natural heritage practices. Um, there are those some significant uh, challenges. So uh, let me just note some of the things we're working on at the moment. Um, so in, in building the research and practice interface in particular, we need to, as, as one um, challenge, build the idea that Panorama Nature Culture can become a database that can also more actively support research and that can be a resource and learning tool for heritage researchers and practitioners um, to, to uh, work together and, 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 and build uh, 
uh, you know, build, build better science. Um, and in that instance, uh, it's important to note that the panorama review process, whilst thorough, is not um, classic journal uh, peer review in how it's working. So we uh, accept perspectives and viewpoints from a wide range of different stakeholders, including local communities, uh, beneficiaries, without undue triangulation, for example. And at the moment, we request in the review process at least two different points of view, um, but we don't go through, as I say, a full journalistic, a full, a full uh, a journal related peer review process. And so we need to start to look at new tools for reviewing and evaluating and analyzing the data produced by Panorama. Um, and um, we need to, I guess, work towards building an evidence base um, that has uh, examples of completed interventions as well, where there's documentation that adds to Panorama um, and that we can build tools to capture um, more fully what makes a solution uh, replicable. Um, another challenge is the inclusion of Indigenous and local and traditional knowledge for policy. Um, these processes have been well initiated and increasingly recognised by the Intergovernmental um, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and the IPCC on climate change. But we still need to, I think, more fully give space for local knowledge and Indigenous knowledge in heritage policy development. Um, a further point is, um, although Panorama focuses on what works, we can learn a lot from what doesn't work. Uh, and so we need to look at the ways in which we learn from uh, things that are not successful examples, but that give us important learning uh, in, in, in just the same way that successes uh, do. And perhaps most importantly, is just the challenge of engaging um, partners and practitioners in contributing to Panorama. So to just under, un, to overcome the, the limits there always are in bringing, bringing people into a new system. So, um, you know, please uh, join in, um, but, but uh, come back on where you see uh, ways in which Panorama could be more accessible, uh, more user friendly, and particularly uh, if you see limitations in terms of technolo technology or uh, access constraints. So if I can just close um, with uh, two slides. So firstly, um, as you, you know, you on this uh, call are part of the solution to Panorama as a whole. Um, there are many, I'm sure, cultural heritage practitioners in the audience. So let me just take this opportunity to invite you to visit Panorama. Uh, to explore, explore the inspiring nature, con the nature culture solutions that is showcasing, but it is showcasing. But if you would like to share your story, uh, your solution, um, then please uh, make contact and please feel this is your platform. Uh, you know, this is here as a service to all of us, but it will only work if we really uh, make it make it work for all of us. So please do engage. Um, lastly, it would just be remiss of me um, having concluded with Panorama not to take a cheeky opportunity um, that you've given me to note that um, the IUCN Youth Summit, the biggest, uh, well, first youth summit that IUCN has hosted will, is about to start. Um, and I have a reason to do this because uh, there is a session on nature culture connections within the Youth Summit program uh, that has come forward from ICOMOS and from the EPWG. Um, and uh, let me thank, thank uh, ICOMOS for also uh, joining joining that uh, effort through the IUCN uh, Youth Summit. Uh, we're some, approaching 7,000 registered uh, delegates. It's going to be a very big event, um, but please, uh, if you are an emerging professional and you'd like to connect, um, please don't miss the opportunity, to, the opportunity to join us and you can see the connection here. Uh, Mireille, with that, um, thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Tim, for presenting us Panorama today. I especially like that it is a community, so it is a bit more flexible to just encourage this exchange and network and learn from each other. Thank you very much. Um, with this presentation, um, I would like to now move to the questions and answers session. Uh, we received a few questions um, in the chat as well from uh, Facebook, so we will try to ask. Um, I just want to check if Roy is still with us. Um, I think he had to leave earlier, so I will spare his question. Um, first question is uh, from Stefan Pomarada from Zoom. Um, he asks, how does this document complement the Culture 2030 indicators released by UNESCO? This is to our PG group, uh, policy guidance group. Um, so who would like to receive this question? Sophia, you have the floor. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, there's actually two documents by UNESCO uh, 
article with exactly the same title. One is about indicators and one is about case studies. And the case study was released in 2019, I believe. Um, internally, it was called the brochure. Uh, I believe that the document that is being referred to by our uh, distinguished colleague is actually the first document, not the indicators. We do not mention indicators in our uh, policy guidance. This is the future step. So um, I believe it's not relevant to discuss indicators for our policy guidance. So I will refer to the um, document by UNESCO, which is um, culture for the uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, a culture for 2030, I think it's called. Um, and so I think it's complementary. Uh, the two publications can be seen, uh, uh, um, yes, as, a, as, a, as both complementing each other. I believe our uh, approach was slightly different because um, we adopted a more comprehensive approach in the sense that we highlight how um, heritage can contribute to each uh, and every SDG, and that was not done by UNESCO. And UNESCO was very much around uh, case studies. And we have case study, but it's to illustrate um, the text, which is the context, which is around, you know, how can heritage address uh, each and every, and every SDG. Uh, so it's slightly different. I also believe that our case study is slightly longer, so people can understand them a little bit more, how um, heritage can address SDG rather than at UNESCO, they were um, a little bit uh, shorter. So this is just the difference. But however, I just wanted to finish by stressing that the two approach are quite similar in advocating for uh, uh, moving away from considering heritage purely as conservation and management, which is something we still see a lot, to considering heritage as a tool for sustainable development. So very, uh, um, uh, 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 they are, both doing the same thing, but they're also very different in their approach. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, anybody else from the policy guidance team who would like to add? Then we can, uh, I can now pass the floor to Laura to um, mon uh, moderate the rest of the questions and answer session. Uh, the next question is for Tim. Thank you, Amira, for, for for this. Uh, so the next question is for Tim. Uh, the question is from Gabriel Caballero. Uh, the, it is, what does it mean that culture is hidden in the solutions? Do solution providers not see the site as successful cultural practices? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gabe. I, I, I mean, I think, it, I, I think Gabe, Gabe's question gives the answer which is um, certainly, I mean, certainly in the world of nature conservation, my sense is that um, the, the, the word culture is not what people are thinking of when they're looking, you know, when they're, you know, actually coming up with ideas about what is what is working in practice. So it's really, you know, to give a sense that um, in the world of nature conservation, actually, lot, you know, there is lots of work in the world of nature conservation that is about connections to culture, but it doesn't, it doesn't get called that. And I guess my sense is, you know, both that we quite often find that we're working on similar things, but that we give them different names. And that's one of the things that sort of stops us from stops us from connecting. Um, and that's partly an artifact of the, you know, the Western ontology and the fact that too much conservation practice has been developed in too few, too few languages, uh, you know, and especially in you know, my, my mother tongue in, in English. And so that, you know, things just don't call, you know, you don't give it a name. Um, and, and so I think that's what Panorama has demonstrated is that if we if we apply the lens of, of, of culture to um, what works in what works in practice, we can curate um, examples where uh, you know culture and nature is actively being brought together. But there are many more examples where that is what's happening. But we just need to sort of identify that that you know identify how it's happening. So yes, it's yes, it is about it being present but you know very broadly but sort of hidden from view because we uh we don't have culture in the lexicon of nature conservation i guess is what's been uh, you know or adequately in, in in the lexicon of nature conservation which is uh, what's been limitation and if you, you know culture was not a keyword in panorama until we brought the nature culture community together for instance 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have the time for uh, one last question. It will be for the policy guidance team. Um, it is, how does the e-commerce plan to address this as making policies is okay, but it is not translated to adequate pressure to the government or willing people, so that all plans be its development or others should include heritage protection. Can you repeat the question, Laura? Yes, of course. How does the e-commerce plans to address this as making policies is okay, but it is not translated to adequate pressure to the government or the, the, the ruling people, so do, that all plans, be it development or other, should include heritage protections? I can add it in the, in the chat box if you want. I can have a stab at starting to answer maybe. Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, it talked about pressuring decision makers, I believe, the question. Um, well, first we have some infrastructure, we have the, the toolkit. Now it's time to use it. And I think um, if we use it um, correctly, uh, we can uh, make some headway in, into that process of um, putting the right kind of pressure on some processes. Um, for decisions to come out in a more culture, heritage, nature friendly way. But I mean, that, that is part of the implementation strategy and which is in the works. Um, partnerships, that's why we're all here together and um, having the right partners and um, getting stakeholders to actually communicate and understand um, what, what, what is meant in such a, um, um, such a subject, such a document and actually see how they can use it themselves. So there's a lot of learning processes um, that need to happen through, um, you know, implementation activities, uh, workshops or advocacy. We talked about advocacy. So um, writing such a document is, is obviously not enough. I mean, it, it's also how we activate it, how to, how we take it to the audiences, how we um, make them listen or, lis or listen to more audiences ourselves to see how we can communicate more effectively. So um, absolutely, that's a, a very necessary kind of ad activity. And e-commerce is already engaged in it. I mean, you can see from our interactions with Habitat and uh, longstanding world heritage processes, and we're still learning. Um, it's a good question. Um, and the answer is it's a long journey and uh, we're moving forward. Thank you, again. I think Linda wants to add something. Um, another little um, addition to what Ege just said, sometimes in some contexts where citizens are more empowered to bring about change, Heritage provides a platform for citizens to get together, discuss their issues, and come up with solutions. So the policy guidance also provides opportunities for that kind of dialogue to start from a grassroots level to then bring about change at the government level. We can't always look at government for the answers. Sometimes citizens need to get together around an issue and be the change that they want to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just watching the time. Um, I think we will have to conclude our questions and answers session. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Gabriel uh, Caballero, the uh, ICOMOS focal point for the uh, sustainable development goals to just wrap up uh, today's discussion before we say our goodbyes. Gabriel, you have the floor. Hi, uh, hi, all. hi, Mirai, thank you very much for this. I think uh, to just add on to what Linda said, the, the policy guidance is a tool, right? If we want to have governments uh, listen to us, we need to have the appropriate tools. And I think this is the starting point to have those kinds of knowledgeable tools that people can use. Um, before I, I, I want, I have a two or three slides to share and allow me to do that before we, we um, end. So uh, thank you very much for everyone. I think the, uh, for the moment, we have had a lot of discussions. You know, we were discussing about five webinars and this is, this is our fifth webinar, right? Then we started off as our first webinar in uh, uh, looking at um, uh, SDG 11 and focusing on cities. And then we moved on to economy and prosperity, uh, focusing on tourism and how is COVID um, part of that 
you know, this, uh, that displaces the whole agenda that we've had and how does tourism recover? We also looked at uh, uh, previous, our previous webinars, we also looked at the planet and how it can be used for uh, environmental resilience. I think Tim has also added in a couple more ideas to that um, today. Uh, the fourth webinar was about people and uh, peace, and that was really about um, rights-based approaches and allowing, creating a, a peaceful world. Uh, we've had, um, uh, and the fifth one today is about policy guidance, policy and partnerships. So we are trying to cover a lot of things uh, for the last couple of um, months. For this webinar, I think it was quite successful. I, I would like to congratulate again our colleagues uh, who has really been instrumental to the work of the policy guidance document. And uh, the, we, we've had um, engagements to, uh, I've noticed 66 people um, aside from um, our collaborators and then uh, national committees and ISCs have contributed. Thank you very much for that. The, the uh, uh, Roy's perspective uh, on uh, urban sustainability is also quite important. And I think from um, starting, well, in the next couple of uh, weeks, we will be uh, engaging further with UN Habitat and uh, discovering how we can in, um, uh, strengthen our own partnership. Uh, I think he has uh, uh, alluded to some focal, uh, focal um, discussions about climate, about uh, urban resilience, and I think uh, these are good starting points. That heritage is not just looking at the, the small scale, we are looking also at the macro scale, at settlements and cities. So I do hope that the more partnerships of, of that sort um, happen. With Tim's uh, presentation, um, it is also good to know that um, uh, collaborations happen outside of World Heritage. I know that Dennis has provided some thoughts that they, why was it about World Heritage in particular, but as Tim said, we need to look at beyond World Heritage and, um, and see that there's a lot more to, to be done. And I was, I was quite surprised, and, but I know this at, at, at the same time that the, uh, having sometimes people see the at the bottom that there's no divide, but at the top it gets divided, and probably because of our own practices, our own uh, PhDs, our own master's degrees that uh, have separated these kinds of fields of knowledge. So if we go back to the basics, that there everything is interrelated, and I think that is the purpose of the SDGs. Now the policy guidance document. Um, sorry, I, I will just click to the next slide. The policy guidance document, uh, uh, we are now in the next phase of our work as uh, the policy guidance team has provided. And then we are now looking at the decade of action. How do we mobilize everyone everywhere, right? This is, uh, we have 10 years to do this. And uh, I think we need to um, find local solutions. So the case studies that have been provided, there are 17 of them, but uh, how do we form, how does heritage form part of the road to recovery and create resilient communities. So we need a lot of people who, who have their own perspectives, have their own case studies to bring to the table in, in ECOMOS and in the SDGs working group and other in your communities and, and really put those links together. I think the, the, we need to also activate heritage practitioners to think about the con, uh, contributing to a bigger uh, issues of society. You know? SDGs is about the bigger picture. You know, we have a lot of issues to resolve. And um, I think the, the, what uh, Roy was saying earlier about uh, uh, human settlements, you know, we have to look at how we contribute to the city, how do we contribute uh, cultural heritage, contribute to natural heritage protection as well. Uh, the other one is uh, relevant indicators. Um, I think uh, um, Sophia was mentioning about case studies and indicators from UNESCO, but uh, we need, uh, we all know that the SDGs um, currently uh, the indicators are not really focused on heritage, but what are the relevant indicators that we can use? Research is quite important. Uh, our, our peers and uh, the case studies that we've had, baseline data that we've gotten, and transform that to real um, data on the ground that can be pushed forward and say that heritage is really a driver of sustainable development. And uh, our, our, we have 10 years, right? We need to have long-term thinking. Uh, that the, it is, a, I think, 10 years is, short, is a short time to act. Uh, when you think about the life uh, cycles of projects, of mo monitoring um, activities, uh, you know, five years is a, a management plan that is usually created, that's two cycles. So we have to go beyond those cycles and see we have a lot more things to do in the, in the next 10 years. And then last two points, uh, I think uh, we, um, 
there was a, a point on 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 governments and also um, how um, top down um, how we influence governments. That is also that's needed very much so. But we are we also need the bottom up approach. So both are intrinsic to the work of heritage and sustainable development. It cannot just be one or the other. Lastly, I think uh, uh, in line with our conversations today, partnerships are quite important. So um, we, we've shared with you um, uh, two of the partnerships that ECOMAS is doing, but uh, I'm sure uh, you've seen the, the, our first webinar. You, we also partner with um, other collaborators for the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign. And I think um, there will be a lot more collaborations that will happen for heritage and sustainable development. These are the pictures of all the people that have been uh, uh, involved in the five um, webinars that we've had. I've, uh, and and we, there's a lot of conversations that have happened. Not just, everyone is not just a, a, a professor or academic. Uh, we are all practitioners coming from different parts of the world. We've actually covered all the parts of the, the, all the regions. And we've tried to be as inclusive as possible. We've had Arabic translations, uh, Spanish, and today you've had French and English. And, but I've left three boxes there to just indicate that it is not just the people that you see in the webinars. But it's, it, is, uh, it is you, it is all of us who are here to provide those solutions, to provide those, uh, to help the journey for heritage to be um, enable sustainable development. And I think uh, this is a starting point. The policy guidance is a, is a tool, but we have to all contribute to that kind of conversation to make heritage as a part or enabler of sustainable development. Uh, just um, contact us. I think uh, Mirai will provide this information as well. But um, do share your thoughts with us, and um, we're happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and a special thanks to all our speakers for their contributions. Please follow us on social media, and uh, do not hesitate to contact if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, I apologize if we had to skip some of the questions, but we had limited time, but right now we are just on time to finalize the webinar. Uh, we will keep you posted on our next online events and we say until next time have a good afternoon and evening to all bye thank you thank you very much thank you bye thanks everybody bye thank you bye. goodbye goodbye thank you bye, bye. bye. bye.